What would be my, how should I call it, spontaneous attitude towards the universe? It's a very dark one. The first one, the first thesis would have been a kind of total vanity. There is nothing, basically. I mean it quite literally. Like, ultimately, ultimately there are just some fragments, some vanishing things. If you look at the universe, it's one big void. But then how do things emerge? Here, I feel a kind of spontaneous affinity with quantum physics, where, you know, the idea there is that universe is a void, but a kind of a positively charged void. And then particular things appear when the balance of the void is disturbed. And I like this idea spontaneously very much, that the fact that it's not just nothing, things are out there, it means something went terribly wrong. That what we call creation is a kind of a cosmic imbalance, cosmic catastrophe, that things exist by mistake. And I'm even ready to go to the end and to claim that the only way to counteract it is to assume the mistake and go to the end. And we have a name for this. It's called love. Isn't love precisely this kind of a cosmic imbalance? I was always disgusted with this notion of I love the world, universal love. I don't like the world. I don't know how I, I basically, I'm somewhere in between. I hate the world or I'm indifferent towards it. But the whole of reality, it's just it. It's stupid. It is out there. I don't care about it. Love for me is an extremely violent act. Love is not I love you all. Love means I pick out something and I, and it's, you know, it's again this structure of imbalance. Even if this something is just a small detail, a fragile individual person, I say I love you more than anything else. In this quite formal sense, love is evil. Who believes what today? Oh, I think this is an interesting question. Much more complex than it may, than it may appear. The first myth to be abandoned, I think, is the idea that we live in a cynical era where nobody believes, no values, and so on, and that there was sometimes, there were sometimes more traditional where people still believed, relied on some substantial notion of belief, and so on, and so on. I think it's today that we believe more than ever. And as Fowler develops it in a nice, ironic way, the ultimate form of belief for him is deconstructionism. Why? Again, I'm going back to that question of quote marks, no? Like, look how it functions, deconstructionism, in its standard version already at the texture of style. Like, you cannot find one text of Derrida without, A, all of the quotation marks, and B, all of these rhetorical, rhetorical distanciations. Like, I don't know, to take an ironic example, if somebody like Judith Butler were to be asked, what is this? She would never have said, this is a, a bottle of tea. She would have said something like, if we accept the, 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 the metaphysical notion of uh, language identifying clearly objects, <laughs> and taking all this into account, then may we not, she likes to put it in this rhetorically, risk the hypothesis that in the conditions of our language game, this can be said to be uh, 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 a bottle of tea and so on and so on. So it's always this need to distantiate. It goes even for love, like nobody almost dares to say today I love you. It has to be as a poet would have put it, I love you or some kind of a distance. <laughs> but what's the problem here? The problem is that uh, why this fear? Because I claim that when the ancients directly said I love you, they meant exactly the same. All these distanciations were included. So it's we today who are afraid that if we were to put it directly, I love you, that it would mean too much. We believe in it. 